Please stand if you're able for the gospel. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice on that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven, for that is what their ancestors did to their prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, Offer the other also, and from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our strength and our salvation. Amen. Please be seated. Being a product of an ecumenical seminary myself, Union in New York, I know the importance of positionality when talking about the church, that phrase that works, that functions in such an important way in a diverse spiritual community, which is, in my tradition, so I decided to really embrace my tradition, since this is an Episcopal-inspired All Saints service. I'm going to tell you a bit about how we think about the Feast of All Saints, and then I'm going to do what Episcopalians love to do, which is talk about buildings and liturgy. But first, a bit about this Feast of All Saints. Despite the national obsession with its minor counterpart, All Hallows' Eve, the night before, in the Episcopal Church, All Saints remains indeed principal for us and deeply beloved. Across the Anglican Communion, some churches on Friday, many transfer to Sunday, you will find the faithful gathering and the way that we like to party best around sacramental tables with beloved hymns, primary of which is for all the saints, so thank you for that. And we have this sacred meal of Holy Communion, and we read our lists of the beloved dead as we will today. Sometimes, in some places, we swing a lot of incense, occasionally over images of our beloved deceased. All an effort to remember those who have run the race before us, who have gathered before us, and who cluster still at the heavenly table, which stretches from our altars all the way to eternity. All Saints is also one of the four dates in our Book of Common Prayer that are most recommended for baptisms. We try to cluster them there, although Pastors like me also give way and do them other times if somebody needs a dress to fit a baby or whatever. But we really aim, you do too, Davies, I know. Um, we aim to put them together in the collected celebration of certain times of year, especially all saints. Baptism, this moment where we place the full rite of initiation into the, what we call the fellowship of the mystical body of Christ. We put it right in the midst of this time where we're also thinking about people who have died. 
to try to underscore the themes that are central throughout the year, renewed life in the face of death, and our own membership in the communion of saints. So that's what we do on All Saints in a nutshell. But this summer I was reminded of it in an entirely different way. I had the opportunity to travel with my parish's choir and some companions. There were 72 of us who flew first to Paris where we sang in a couple of masses and then we went across the channel to England where we took up residence in a cathedral in a town called Ely, a small medieval cathedral city about 15,000 permanent residents, clustered around this unbelievable structure. We were there to be in residence to sing our daily rite of even song, something that is at the core in the Anglican tradition. The Cathedral de Ely was actually first built as an abbey in the sixth century under the direction of an abbess named Etheldreed. That has nothing to do with All Saints, I just like that. <laughs> Etheldreed somehow compelled a group of monks to build an abbey there on the hill in Cambridgeshire, where the daily patterns of remembrance, prayer, worship, communion, chant, filled that holy space. The Danes came through and sacked the abbey in the 9th century. And then in the 11th century, they started rebuilding as a cathedral, and it was completed towards the end of the 11th century. When the Protestant reformer Thomas Cromwell came through a few centuries later, this was actually his hometown, so he had a real axe to bear, he was conflicted because the paintings of the angels that were high above in the, what they call the cathedral lantern were so exquisite that no one could really bear to erase them in the drive to take away the iconography in the space. But in the Lady Chapel, an enormous room, an enormous chapel off to the side, there were figurine statues of saints all the way around, hundreds of them, about this big, surrounding the saints, surrounding the space. And Cromwell and his men decided those they could aim and deface, and they bashed their heads off one by one. What's remarkable is in the subsequent generations, those bodies, those headless bodies, have remained in the chapel. A testament of the tumult that comes through all of our spaces over history, all of our times of reform and conflict a collected history that cathedrals hold. But as I prayed in that chapel, surrounded by these truly freaky headless bodies, I was struck by something else. The faceless saints. The saints that were no longer named or identifiable while on the one hand, suitably ghoulish in this Halloween season, it also resonates when we think about the Feast of All Saints. You see, in the Episcopal Church and the Anglican tradition, we have held the practice of praying for and commemorating saints. We don't pray to them. We don't ask pray, saints to pray for us, but we do mark the saints in our liturgical traditions. So in the Anglican world, in cathedrals, in some churches, you will find daily commemorations of fe feasts of this saint or that. The ancients, such as St. Mark or Matthew, Stephen the martyr, that first deacon, early church parents, or monastics such as Francis and Claire of Assisi, Benedict of Nursia, Gregory of the Great. 
We commemorate Catholics, we commemorate Orthodox, and we commemorate 20th century saints as well, like Florence Nightingale, Justice Thurgood Marshall, freedom writer, seminarian, and martyr Jonathan Merrick Daniels, and the Reverend Polly Murray, who was a civil rights activist and a lawyer, and the first African-American woman to be ordained an Episcopal priest. So in my tradition, we very much honor specific, named, imaged saints of the church. But on the Feast of All Saints, we sort of turn another way to those headless, faceless saints. Removed long ago in a fit of ecclesial peak, now they can remind us of something else, all the saints. All those baptized souls who maybe didn't make history, but definitely make the church. The saints who were never recorded other than maybe in some baptismal records in their various and sundry parishes. This is the feast of the family of the church. The mothers and fathers, aunts and uncles, sisters and brothers who are the body of Christ, who are the church, who keep the doors open, who do all the things no matter the tradition or denomination, that keep us fed and nourished as one. You know them. You remember them. You were nourished by them. You probably are them. This is the feast of the altar guild, of the church council. This is the feast of the janitors, of the church ladies, and now gentlemen, who have laid out meal after meal. This is the feast of both the shouting preacher and the mousy Sunday school teacher, of the patient lay folks who faithfully visit the sick, of the justice advocates who take to the streets. This is the feast of the aunties who run the weddings, the sisters and brothers who work the food pantry, or of my grandfather who ushered every Sunday of his adult life at his little Episcopal church in the Shenandoah Valley and stood at the back and would jingle his keys and change when the sermon got a bit too long. This is the Feast of the Beatitudes, the text that reminds us that God always opts for, stands with, and particularly blesses the humble, the unnamed, the meek, those who mourn, those who are not noticed, and especially those on the margins and those who are oppressed, those who are shoved there by systems of violence and neglect, those who know their need for God and recognize in God that they are empowered and they are blessed. They are beloved, all the saints, who from their labors rest, but whose labors never went unnoticed by God. This is the feast of the saints of the church, nameless and faceless. You know them. We remember them. Now, I visited another church this summer. Not too far from that grand cathedral, a smaller band of us journeyed to a village church in Ufford, in East Anglia. Ufford is tiny. There is Basically no reason to go there, unless perhaps you're buying a cow. Or visiting St. Mary of the Assumption, a church built also in the 11th century, smaller than this room, with some remaining Norman walls from an earlier time. Its tower and extraordinary woodwork was finished in the 14th and 15th century and is actually an architectural influence on my own church here in Indianapolis, Trinity. It's a nothing town. It's a nothing church in some ways. Fewer than probably 15 people worship there on a Sunday. The warden lives next door. That's why she's warden, because it just makes sense, she said, for her to have the keys. But St. Mary of the Assumption in Ufford has 
one incredibly notable thing, an unbelievably ornate baptismal font. It has a cover that stretches six meters high all the way up to the ceiling. It's adorned with this telescoping set of crowns that are clearly influenced by the papal wear, the mitres of the popes of the time of its building. It is clearly and demonstrably a very Catholic thing. This highly ornate, highly adorned crown upon crown at the baptismal font, carved in painstaking detail with finials and flowers. It is moved by pulling and counterweight, hoisted up so that the babies that have been baptized underneath that are under this very heavy object held by the earliest of machinery. Underneath that is an elaborately carved stone bowl of water. Imagine it, if you will, in the middle of the country, in the middle of nowhere, simple country folk being baptized year after year after year, decade after decade, century after century in that bowl, baby after baby, child after child, probably the occasional adult, being brought into the household of God, into communion with the saints by a simple act that nonetheless collects all of the mystery of Christ's sacrifice and the mystery of our membership bound by grace, mercy, and justice, the fellowship of the body of Christ. At the top of the font is an image of a pelican, a very early Eucharistic symbol, a mother bird feeding her young with her blood. I can tell you more about that another time. This bowl, this font, marks the saints of God, the no-names, the nobodies, the non-entities in the middle of nowhere who are nonetheless holy and sacred, bound together with the most famous of church history, all one in the body of Christ. God knows them and blesses them. It's said when the Puritans came to St. Mary of Ufford, the people surrounded the church to keep them out. They knew they were coming to destroy their beautiful images, their beautiful icons. Cromwell's men aimed to rid it of its Catholic influence, and they were stymied by the wardens who blocked the door by kneeling and praying before them. Eventually, they got in. They made their way in. And by some grace, they spared that font. Maybe because of its beauty. Maybe because they could recognize the workmanship of someone else's hands. And that that's holy and mighty. Or maybe because they understood the importance of the function that no matter our tradition, no matter our theology, we are one in baptism. And that is to be held as sacred protected no matter what. All of us, saints indeed. This is the nature of all saints. This is the nature of baptism. This is the nature of this day when we remember the faithful baptized, named and unnamed, who approached the heavenly table before we did to be nourished in the same communion which we will today. So I invite you, on your way to the table, Remember your baptism. There is water here. I did my Episcopal thing and blessed it. Whether you were baptized as a baby, whether you were baptized as an adult, whether you were fully immersed or just got the lamest little sprinkle, which we do, Remember that you are fully washed with the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ. And we are bound together in that communion at this table and throughout all of time. Blessings and joy on this feast of all saints. Blessings and joy to you this day. Amen.